Okay, good afternoon. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome everyone and let you know that this is the final presentation in our 2012 Local Government Tele-Institute Tele Program. Excuse me. My name is Kathy Brown. I'm an Extension Educator with the Community and Economic Development Team. I'm based in Fulton, Mason, Peoria, and Caswell County. Um, today's program, Siting and Permitting Wind Farms, presents a great model of University of Illinois Extension's programming with an emphasis on local programs that are focused on the future for communities. University of Illinois Extension's reorganization created a whole new structure and new opportunities for collaboration in programming around critical issues that face Illinois communities. Understanding the impact and the opportunities for wind energy has, has been and will continue to be an issue of critical importance for individuals, business, and government. This um, program that we're going to be participating today represents coordination of this issue-based and ongoing interdisciplinary extension program within the university as well as with outside agencies and institutions that continues to be a part of, of our outreach efforts. Today's program will bring together, brings together community and economic development programming and energy and environment educator teams within the University of Illinois Extension. And we're also partnering or collaborating with the Illinois Wind Energy Group that's based at Illinois State University in today's program. I want to say a special thanks to um, both of my colleagues, Zach Kennedy, who is a community and economic development educator um, based in Champaign, Ford, and Iroquois County. Um, Zach is our uh, technician extraordinaire today, and he is handling uh, all of the, the technical aspects of today's program. He has, uh, because we're recording today's program, everyone's lines except for those who are presenting are, are muted. And we do that um, not to stifle conversation, but more so to control the environment for recording purposes. We have this year for the first time begun to um, actually record the programs as they are um, being presented. That allows us to post this information on the University of Illinois Extension's website for viewing any time by other officials who weren't able to participate in the live program. And we'll continue to market that opportunity. Um, the the um, host for today's program will be Jay Solomon. He is an extension educator in environmental and energy stewardship. And he is based in Joe Davies, Stevenson, and Winnebago uh, County. We'll um, be sure to provide you with the actual uh, website at the end of the program, again, to remind you that you can share the information with other members of the county board um, by going to um, webextension.illinois.edu, L-G-I-E-N, and you'll find this recording. So help us by making sure that you mute your phone by pressing pound five, and there will be opportunities to ask questions um, throughout the program, but we're encouraging you, as we have all year, to put your questions in writing in the chat box, if at all possible, or um, ask to uh, unmute your phone. You can also uh, type a little note in the chat box, letting the, the facilitators know that you have a question. And so we, we do want to hear from you, and we do want you to be engaged in the program, but we're going to try to control for the back ground noise as much as possible. Let me turn over the program to Jay Solomon, who will actually provide um, more information on the content of today's program and give a more formal introduction of our, our presenters today with the Illinois Wind Energy Group. Jay? Thank you, Kathy. Glad to have a chance to join this group uh, representing the Energy and Environmental Stewardship uh, team. Uh, glad to have a chance to collaborate on this program and put uh, this information out there for our county officials and others who are interested in knowing what's going on, knowing what the resources out there are. Uh, don't want to take a lot of time from our presenters. We've got a, a pair of very experienced and very knowledgeable presenters. Uh, I'm 
know who will be able to fill the time here and, and will provide a lot of the information that you're looking for. Um, I want to start out that we're going to talk primarily about utility scale, and if utility scale is predicted, utility scale wind is predicted to continue to grow in this area. Uh, given the the current uh, renewable energy ideas that are out there, uh, some of the policies that are out there, uh, there's a lot of opportunities that I know that Dr. Loomis and others are going to talk about. Uh, as to why that's going to continue to grow. Um, we look, we're going to try to give you a balanced uh, look at what uh, the information that's out there is and also what some of the issues are and the resources that are available to you. Uh, one of the things that as part of the Energy Environmental Stewardship Team want to remind you if you're looking at ordinances in the city or county ordinances, recognize that uh, while these ordinances may be focused a lot at large wind, uh, they may also have an impact on your local homeowners' options for individual or small-scale uh, wind applications as well. Uh, and we've run into some interesting questions uh, on that uh, at, over the time of how these regulations may apply. So with that, we'll move forward. Uh, I'll go forward toward introducing our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Dave Loomis is uh, with Illinois State University Center for Renewable Energy, uh, is actually the director of it, someone I've worked with quite a bit, is a member of the Illinois Wind Working Group. Dr. Loomis' background is in, is in economics, brings uh, that view of the, the why and what's driving the industry here uh, for us. And as you can see, there's quite a bit more information about Dr. Loomis on the screen. Uh, but in favor of getting things moving, I'll turn this over to Dr. Lucas and let him get his presentation uh, to, to get us started off this afternoon. Dave? Jay, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, you um, your introduction, and, and uh, it has been great to, uh, to work together. So I'm going to look at, at wind farms in your community and, and try and focus uh, the remarks uh, later on towards um, you may encounter uh, as a county board or, or uh, your zoning board of appeals um, as you look at large-scale uh, wind farms. As Jay said, I am professor of economics, so my focus is really on uh, economic analysis, and I'm going to be presenting some of the research that we've done at the center and some of the, uh, the research that my graduate students have done as part of their academic coursework uh, at the university. As Jay uh, indicated, he's part of the Illinois Wind Working Group, and the Illinois Wind Working Group's uh, purposes are to communicate uh, wind opportunities honestly and objectively, to communicate with the various stakeholders, so uh, you would be included in that as county officials and to promote uh, economic development um, of, uh, of opportunities of wind energy in the, in the state. There's uh, 34 different state wind working groups across the country. They're part of Wind Powering America, the U.S. Department of Energy's program uh, to promote um, uh, wind energy. And um, we uh, did receive funding uh, from the U.S. Department of Energy to run the wind working group. Um, the, uh, the grants have uh, expired at this point, but and, and we're probably up over 200 stakeholders at this point uh, that are um, part of the Illinois Wind Working Group. If you would like to be part of the Wind Working Group, there's no charge to be part of that. You get on our mailing list where we provide information about uh, conferences and um, you know additional information as it becomes available as it would pertain to uh, wind farms. And um, it's not uh, too onerous a, a distribution list in terms of the number of emails that you that you receive. Uh, you will uh, see uh, here we have a conference coming up July 17th and 18th, and that's where we – it's a two-day conference. We try and cover all aspects of wind energy from the siting and zoning of, of wind farms to technology to uh, public policy issues. And you can see our website there. You'll you can uh, see all of the research that I'm going to be presenting today 
uh, are out on uh, reports out on the website. You can access it uh, through that website listed there. Our Center for Renewable Energy has three uh, purposes. So the center is the umbrella group for the Illinois Wind Working Group. And we actually have a major in renewable energy. So students get a Bachelor of Science in Renewable Energy. That's an interdisciplinary program between agriculture, uh, economics, uh, and the Department of Technology. Uh, our purpose is also to uh, serve the renewable energy community by providing information. Uh, and uh, to do applied research um, in the area of renewable energy. So, so why wind energy? Why are we seeing uh, so much uh, wind energy development across uh, the state? Um, there's a number of different uh, things. Uh, it, it certainly uh, revitalizes uh, rural economies, and we'll look at some of the economic impacts and the studies that quantify that for Illinois a little bit later on. Uh, as well as the job impacts, but it, it promotes uh, cost-effective uh, energy production. The cost of wind energy has, has declined uh, quite a bit uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, it supports agriculture, so it's compatible with uh, agricultural use and, in fact, um, would uh, keep uh, land in agricultural production um, uh, and, and not change over, say, for uh, residential housing development or other uh, land uses um, as the land will be leased for a long period of time to the wind farm. Uh, it's uh, clean domestic energy and helps uh, ensure our, our uh, sustainable energy future. Well, I want to get, take a little bit of time to, to kind of say, well, what's, how's Illinois compared to all of the United States? and and kind of where do we uh, stack up? And um, as of the end of 2011, uh, Illinois was the fourth largest uh, wind state uh, in terms of wind capacity installations. Uh, we're behind Texas, Iowa, and California. In case city Texas is way out there, I don't think anybody's going to uh, catch them. And then uh, Iowa and California is quite a bit larger uh, than we are here in Illinois. Uh, Illinois is kind of in this grouping with uh, Minnesota, Washington, and Oregon that kind of vies for, um, you know, fourth through eighth place. Um, and then a number of other states have seen uh, significant uh, installations come along uh, in the recent past. 2011 was a very good year for Illinois. We, were, we added the most capacity right behind uh, California. And so um, that kind of vaulted us into the number four position uh, regarding other states. Uh, if you look at that just geographically, the, the thing that I think that stands out uh, at you in this map is how uh, the white states are really clustered around the southeast uh, United States. And the reason for that uh, is really has to do with the wind resource. You need uh, steady winds uh, that are uh, uh, good enough to support uh, wind energy uh, development because the electrical power that you're going to get out uh, of that or the, actually the energy that's contained in the wind, uh, if you will, is a cubic function of the wind speed. So, for example, if you were to double the wind speed, or better yet, if you had two different wind farms and one wind farm had all other things equal, I uh, had double the wind speeds, average wind speeds, you would be getting eight times the amount of electrical output out of the one um, that had double the wind speed. And so wind speed is critically important uh, to electrical production, and electrical production is, is critically important. Uh, to uh, revenues, so as far as a payback, uh, it really looks at wind speeds, and um, the southeast has much lower uh, wind speeds uh, than other parts uh, of the U.S. It's not just wind speeds that, that uh, you need, but you also need uh, available transmission capacity, and uh, thirdly, uh, you need um, demand or you need a very large load center or demand center uh, where they're going to need large amounts of electricity and preferably 
uh, that uh, demand would be nearby where you're generating uh, the electricity so that you don't have to go over long distances uh, to see that uh, transmission. And in Illinois, we have all three. So let me turn now to wind farms in Illinois. If you uh, see kind of our, our map of Illinois and where um, the large wind farms, so these are uh, um, uh, large wind farms uh, across the state as well as average wind speed. So if you're looking at the greenish uh, tint uh, of the map, you're looking at lower wind speeds, and if you're looking at the, the bluer part of the map, you're looking at higher wind speeds. And not surprisingly, most of the existing wind farms here in Illinois are built uh, where the uh, higher wind speeds are. It also happens to coincide, we don't have it listed on the map, but it coincides with where transmission lines are already existing and already uh, built. So, for example, uh, if you uh, look at the kind of uh, southeast corner uh, uh, portion, there's two large dots that overla uh, overlap. And if you can see them, they're called Twin Groves 1 and Twin Groves 2. That's a uh, wind farm in East McLean County. And uh, that's built right along a transmission line that connects, uh, that was built originally to connect the Clinton nuclear power plant uh, into the Chicago grid market. And most of the power flows from uh, Clinton um, northward. Um, uh, and so the, the wind farm uh, was built in a very windy area where it's blue, uh, but also right by the transmission line so they could tie into that transmission line and the power into the to uh, the Chicago market. So you see, we have uh, the the size of the dots represent the uh, size of the wind farm, and we have kind of a clustering around uh, certain counties. You see McLean County and some others uh, that um, have had uh, multiple wind farms uh, built uh, in their area. Uh, but what's happening is that. Um, all the available transmission and the windiest spots in those counties have already been taken up. And so probably uh, why a lot of people are on this call is that your county uh, is now uh, looking at the possibility of having a wind farm built in your county. Uh, and so uh, the concentration that we've seen in just a handful of counties it is spreading out uh, further and further in the state. You can see, uh, according to, to the map, that, that uh, uh, you know, you could go uh, down to say I-72 and maybe a little bit b below that in the Springfield area. There's places in western uh, Illinois that uh, would also uh, have uh, uh, bluish areas. Uh, but we're probably not going to see much in southern Illinois due to the low uh, wind speeds uh, that are available uh, down in, in southern Illinois. So if we look at the wind farms uh, by county and those that have uh, been completed and those that are under construction, um, excuse me, but that, that uh, 150 megawatt uh, that is listed in McLean County as under construction has now actually been uh, completed. Uh, so we can move that over into the, to the left-hand column. Uh, so really you're looking at almost 550 megawatts of completed wind farms, operational wind farms in McLean County. Um, they've also had two permitted projects that have yet to be built. And so McLean County, which is where Illinois State is, is located, so I, I have lots of wind farms around me. Um, and um, uh, it is the, the uh, probably the leading county. So if you want uh, to talk to um, county officials that have been through this, a number of times you might contact uh, some McLean County uh, folks because they've been around this uh, quite a few times. Number two would be LaSalle County and then uh, Ford and Iroquois County um, have a wind farm um, that uh, is joint, uh, overlaps the two counties. Uh, Livingston County, DeKalb County, Lee County, uh, and so forth you can uh, see down the list. Interestingly enough, you've got um, under construction Bureau County and, and Henry County, um, and uh, some of those um, may be completed. We're just in the process of updating our database. 
Um, and you can get information from the database at that website that I listed at the beginning of the, the uh, presentation. Uh, and we try and update that twice a year uh, with the latest information on, on what projects have been gone through permitting, what are under construction, and what is completed uh, construction. Looking at permitted projects, you can see that uh, Henry County still has quite a few permitted projects. Um, uh, McLean County's also got a number of uh, uh, large projects uh, that have permitted but has not started construction, and we'll talk uh, a little bit uh, more about that. When we turn to uh, the issue of taxes, um, I just want to um, make note of this because it, it, there has led to, to some confusion. We have, prior to, to 2007, each county would decide for itself how to assess the value of a wind turbine for property taxes. So uh, there's, uh, um, the county assessors would make a determination for that county of that particular wind farm in that county, how much would be personal property and how much would be real property. Um, and they would oftentimes do that if they had another electric generating plant, like a coal plant or a nuclear plant, uh, that they use a consistent methodology with that. Uh, but it, would, it led to different outcomes in different counties, uh, and the wind developers weren't sure uh, exactly how they were going to be treated for tax purposes, and that created difficulties for them in terms of their financial modeling. And the counties like the uh, certainty of knowing exactly how it was going to be assessed because then if you have your, your tax rate, you can say exactly how much you're going to get in taxes from a wind farm moving uh, on board. And so in 2007, uh, there was uh, a Public Act 95-0644 um, uh, that gave uh, just a set evaluation of the project based on the number of uh, megawatts. So it's based on capacity uh, of the wind farm, and it's uh, uniform across uh, the state. So there's no more, in a sense, discretion on the part of the county assessors, uh, but everybody knows exactly how it's going to be treated for tax purposes. And there's uh, adjustments for inflation and depreciation uh, that come in uh, there, but the wind farm can't be um, uh, depreciated uh, down to, to nothing. There's a, there's a bottom level cap, and there's also adjustments for inflation. And that law, as, as most in Illinois, had a sunset provision, uh, and so it was due to, to sunset. But in April of 2010, uh, it, that um, public act was extended, and so that's covered through um, 2016. But if it ever does expire, so say in 2017, it's not as if the wind farms will, won't pay any taxes at that point. What will happen uh, is that if it were to expire in 2007, it would uh, revert back to the county assessor's office to make a determination of what the valuation of that particular wind farm is in that county. And they could use this public act as, as a guideline, or they could use their own methodology in terms of uh, real and personal property and what they've done in other uh, cases. But in, in either case, they're going to pay taxes at the county tax rate, just uh, what is the um, uh, assessed value uh, could change, but we'll revert that back to the county assessor's office. It's just a formula that takes a look at some of the uh, uh, issues to, to, to say if you had uh, a cost basis just for a two megawatt uh, capacity uh, turbine, uh, single turbine, um, it would uh, go up based on the trending factor, that's the inflation factor, uh, but it would also go down based on uh, depreciation allowance. Uh, and so those two can, uh, they, they work at odds with one another, but but basically, um, you move uh, along and, and um, um, take into account both, both factors. I'll turn now to some of the research that we've done in this uh, last year. I won't be able to cover uh, all of the different uh, research reports, 
uh, in in great detail. But as I said before, the the uh, PDF files of all these research reports uh, are out on our website for you to take a look at. The first report really deals with the RPS, or what's known as the, the Renewable Portfolio Standard. So one of the drivers of demand in Illinois is that we enacted, uh, as part of the Illinois Power Agency Act, a Renewable Portfolio Standard. So the Renewable Portfolio Standard is a mandate for the investor-owned utilities to buy an ever-increasing amount of their um, electricity from renewable resources. And so that act puts in to place uh, what's the definition for renewable energy and, in fact, has different percentages. So there's a requirement for that that 75% of that renewable energy has to be wind energy. And then more recently, they've passed additional legislation that says that 6% of that renewable energy base has to be uh, from uh, solar. But we, we are marching uh, forward uh, under this renewable portfolio standard towards uh, a requirement that 25% of our uh, electrical uh, usage of uh, residential and small business customers of investor-owned utilities uh, would come from uh, renewable resources. So it's, it's known as 25 by 25, 25% uh, renewables by the year 2025. Now, that excludes uh, some critical elements. It does not include, um, under the Renewable Portfolio Standard, does not, the law does not mandate co-ops uh, or municipalities uh, to buy renewable uh, resources. Some of them do voluntarily, but they're not part of the Renewable Portfolio Standard. Until recently, if you went with a competitive supplier, uh, that was not included under the Renewable Portfolio Standard, uh, but that has since been changed so that um, if you go with a power marketer, that would change. Um, and so uh, uh, there's there's some kind of nuances of that, but basically the headline is that, that we're going to have 25% of our electricity from uh, renewable resources by 2025. And we're, I think, between 5 and 6% um, in the last year or so uh, in renewable resources. And that percentage increases uh, by 1% to 2% each year until we get up to 25% by the year 2025. The method that this is uh, used um, is a procurement method by the Illinois Power Agency where they buy um, either one year what's called renewable energy credits uh, or the green certificates that come off of a, a renewable project or uh, most recently they've engaged in long-term contracts so LT is long-term we're looking at longer term contracts um, for uh, renewable uh, energy well let me talk a little bit about uh, some of the research that my graduate students have done. The first research uh, report was done uh, by uh, Jennifer Hinman who, while she was a graduate student here at uh, Illinois State and this was her graduate research project. And she looked at what happens to property values when uh, a wind farm uh, comes into uh, a particular uh, area. And in this case, she looked at the Twin Groves Wind Farm in East McLean County that I pointed out in the map uh, before. And so uh, we did a couple different uh, things. Um, we were looking to see if properties decreased in value, uh, and this is just looking at residential property, so we're not looking at farm values or commercial property or anything, so it's residential uh, property. And um, uh, did that was that affected by the wind farm kind of coming into being? So we kind of looked at, at that um, in a couple of different ways in looking at the data. In, in our first pass, you can see bullet point two there. We had a two-stage model uh, where we said uh, period one was before the wind farm came into operation, and period two was after the wind farm came into uh, uh, existence. And in this model, we tried to account for everything that you could think of 
that would affect uh, property values. So it was um, uh, for a residential property, it was number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, uh, garage, two car garage, three car garage. Um, uh, was it on a cul-de-sac? Uh, is it near a railroad? Um, uh, everything that we could get a, a, a good information uh, on, uh, we uh, had in the model. And after accounting for all those effects, we actually found that properties increased um, after the wind farm started operation uh, by 17.2%. Uh, um, and I should say that this is, uh, we ended uh, our analysis in, in uh, 2000, I believe it was 2008. And so we've eliminated kind of the, the decline in property values that, uh, or the uh, residential uh, real estate collapse that's happened uh, over the last um, uh, four years. Um, but uh, we, we were actually very surprised by that result. We thought that we would um, um, either find a, a decrease uh, or a, a no uh, impact at all. So we tried to, to look at it in a, couple, in a different way, and we said perhaps uh, there's a, um, a different way that we could look at this in terms of the timeline where we said well, what ideally we'd like to, to look at is when the wind farm first, when, when people first heard that there might be a wind farm coming into existence, um, that, that um, we could look at that because that might have an impact uh, on, on things. And so we could not get uh, that information. The best we could do in terms of a verified date uh, was to say when the wind developer or when Twin Grows filed with the county for its permit. So in the three-stage three model, we have the time before, um, way before the wind farm um, was asked for a permit. The middle period, stage two, is between the time that they filed for a permit till through construction uh, until it became operational. And then period three is after um, the wind farm was operational. And what we found was that um, uh, relative to this first period before the, the uh, permitting, that um, in the second period, properties actually depreciated. They went down by 11.7% um, after the county permitted, but before operation in this middle period. And then afterwards, uh, it became operational. You actually saw an 11.7 appreciation, but not relative to the, to the middle period, relative to the very first period. Uh, and so um, from, the, from the bottom, uh, you get actually a, a 22, 23% um, uh, increase after the wind farm becomes operational. And um, uh, that was a very interesting result to us, more of kind of a U-shaped, a, a dip, and that could be caused by a number of things. One, it could be caused by a kind of a fire sale. People worried about a wind farm coming in, and so they sell at, at uh, reduced prices. It could be that during construction, during permitting and construction, there's an awful lot of uh, activity and, and, and big equipment coming through roads and, and people, again, um, that, that affected uh, the price that people could get. Um, and it, um, uh, so it could be quite a number of reasons um, during that middle period, but it seems uh, that it bounced back and bounced back by even more than the original one uh, in this third period. So no matter what we did, there was strong uh, real estate appreciation after accounting for everything else after the wind farm became operational. And that could be due to uh, increased tax base um, due to the wind farm coming in, uh, better schools, if, better school, if, if more money flowing into the school yields better schools, uh, it could be um, the effect of uh, good neighbor payments that some of these uh, homeowners might have gotten if they're close to the wind farm. Uh, the wind farm developer might have paid um, a, an annual fee uh, that would uh, 
go with the new property owner. So a number of things could happen in this case. And I'd be happy to answer questions at the end of the presentation, either on uh, this uh, or um, uh, other things as we um, uh, move along. Um, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll get through the slides and then we can have a discussion. I'll make sure that we have uh, plenty of time for that. We did a second property value uh, study. Uh, another graduate student needed another research project to, to do to get uh, his master's degree. And so Jason Carter um, looked at, at Lee County. And uh, in Lee County, there's three different wind farms uh, that were uh, um, built at different times. And so we could, in, in different, slightly different areas. And so uh, we got uh, sales data uh, of homes that had sold during, um, during this time period. Uh, we had um, close to, to 1,300 real estate transactions going back from 1998. Um, but in this case, we, we included through 2010. So it does have some of this uh, effect in the later time of just um, real estate, you know, price collapse uh, in things that, that could uh, affect um, uh, the results. But in his case, he, he found again uh, that um, residential property values were not affected uh, by the presence of these wind farms. Um, and uh, the Mendota Hills wind farm, which is the oldest of those, um, uh, we could say with, with certainly certainty because we had enough statistical evidence, but there was um, fewer sales observations in the Lee uh, uh, DeKalb wind farm and the GSG wind farm um, to be able to say something with a statistical uh, accuracy. Moving on now to our economic impact report. This is a report that I've uh, written. I think we've updated the last three or four years. So each year I try and keep it updated. And this was the report that came out uh, last June. Uh, it looks at, at wind farms that are greater than 50 megawatts across uh, the state. We had 17 of those projects uh, at 2,400 megawatts. You notice in my earlier slides we, had, we were up to 2,700. Uh, so those are about 300 megawatts of projects that we built uh, in the state since June. And I used a model that was known as the Jobs and Economic Development Impacts. It, it's based off of InPlan, which is an economic uh, impact uh, software. But that's a JEDI model, or, or Jobs and Economic Impact uh, model, looks at uh, particularly at energy projects, and I use the wind uh, module, but they have ones for solar and natural gas and, uh, and other types of uh, uh, electrical generation sources. These are the list of wind farms that I included, the 17 different wind farms and what counties that, uh, they were from and how big they were. And then this is kind of the results. So if you look at the three bubbles, uh, if you're familiar with it, uh, impact analysis, you, you're looking at um, uh, three different impacts. You're looking at the direct impacts, so that's that first bubble uh, that looks at uh, two parts. You have the construction phase and you have the operational phase. And during the construction phase, you've got uh, people that are going to work. These are short-term jobs. Uh, but you can, uh, when I when I list jobs, I don't just look at, at jobs, but these are really uh, job years or man years um, uh, here. So 1,800 um, jobs could uh, have been um, uh, 3,600 jobs that only lasted six months, and then I would have counted them uh I would have annualized it and said, no, really, that's like 1,800 jobs of somebody working a full year. So just to explain that. Um, and then uh, during the construction uh, phase and direct impacts, these are people who are doing uh, laying foundations, pouring concrete, laying rebar, uh, working the cranes on site directly uh, to build the wind farm. 
Uh, and similarly, the operation phase, these, when we count a job, these are largely wind uh, turbine technicians that are working on the wind farm for the wind developer or wind owner um, with things. Then the next bubble is what's called the indirect and induced impacts. The indirect uh, impacts really deal with the turbine and supply chain impacts. So if we were to take a wind farm in Illinois and, uh, for example, the gearbox that that was contained was built from a gearbox built by Winergy that happens to be in Elgin, Illinois, we want to uh, we want to count that impact. So that might have employed more people at Winergy Factory, or we have Trinity Towers uh, that builds um, uh, towers, the, the, the tall towers. And so th uh, to the extent that we um, uh, they use Trinity Towers, uh, then uh, we get more jobs uh, in uh, Clinton, Illinois, from Trinity Towers and so forth. So we capture that in that second box. Uh, it also includes things like the local concrete um, supplier that pours all the concrete, the local uh, supplier of rebar and, and so forth. So that's all contained in that second bubble. Also contained in there is the payments to landowners. So of the existing wind farms, so these are just the 17 uh, wind farms already in existence, we're already seeing over $10 million in payments to uh, landowners in the form of lease payments, and that's on an annual basis. Local property tax revenue uh, that these uh, uh, would pay would be $22 million a year. Uh, and then there's a, it supports an additional over 11,000 construct, construction jobs during the construction phase. Uh, in a, uh, 458 local jobs during the operational phase. And so you get the total economic impact of both the direct and indirect uh, impacts and take that over the lifetime of the wind farm that we estimated to be 25 years, and you're looking at a total economic impact to the state of over $4 billion, over 13,000 construction jobs, um, and uh, almost 600 uh, local long-term jobs uh, created uh, from the wind farms. We're also doing a study on decommissioning costs. Um, and as you can see, the decommissioning costs here, we, we just started gathering the data, but decommissioning costs vary widely. Um, and we're working on doing some type of analysis where we can make sense of normalizing this and explaining why there's such a wide variation. We were hoping that you would see kind of some economies of scale. So if you have a larger project, the cost per kilowatt to decommission that project uh, would go down. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be a very clear relationship if we look at it graphically. Uh, so this is still a work uh, in project, a uh, work in progress. So we're still, in fact, I met with my student today to try and um, uh, push this project forward. So we can talk about decommissioning costs, but I don't have um, a report uh, out there because uh, we're still a work in progress. So if we look at trends for 2012 and, and beyond, uh, there is the issue on the federal side of the production tax credit. The production tax credit is the largest um, um, of the uh, subsidies that wind farms uh, get uh, to be built, and it's due to expire uh, at the end of this year. So a wind farm, in order to qualify for the production tax credit, needs to be operational by uh, the end uh, of uh, 2012. And since it takes, uh, with some wiggle room, um, about a year to build a wind farm, you can probably do it within six months, but a year uh, is, is fairly comfortable um, with construction delays and weather and so forth. We're not likely to see a whole lot of new construction started now until the production tax credit gets extended, and we're likely to see delays in new construction started for each quarter that it takes for the, that production tax credit to get extended, if indeed it does get uh, extended. There has been talk in the past of some type of federal renewable portfolio standard, but 
uh, it does not, um, uh, I haven't heard a lot of talk about that recently. Uh, we are also have some regional issues in terms of the Midwest. Uh, we need some new transmission capacity. So as we look across uh, MISO as the Midwest ISO and PJM uh, is Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland. It is where the Commonwealth Edison Territory is. And if you're in Ameren Territory downstate, it's in the Midwest ISO. And both are looking at expansion plans, uh, particularly for uh, wind energy and wind farms. And then we also have problems because Illinois is a competitive state, a restructured state, where our utilities are no longer under rate of return regulation. Uh, but some of our neighboring states, Iowa and Missouri and Indiana, are still under rate of return regulation where they have guaranteed uh, recovery of uh, their uh, investments in terms of ratepayer rate. And that uh, puts us in an unequal uh, playing field when Illinois wind projects compete with Iowa wind projects or Indiana wind projects. So uh, as far as our state RPS requirement, we had what's called an in-state preference. So there was a preference put into the law to buy uh, wind energy coming from Illinois wind farms, and that has expired. And so um, Iowa and Indiana wind projects compete directly with Illinois wind projects for Illinois ratepayers to, to pay for this uh, renewable energy. Uh, and that, that causes some problems in terms of uh, building projects here. Uh, as well, we have an Illinois power agency. That's the one that, that actually buys the renewable energy. And they have changed uh, directors. And there's some uncertainty about how they're going to do their procurement, how they're going to do their buying, and whether they're going to do any long-term contracts. And recently, there was a law passed known as the Smart Grid Bill or the Energy Modernization Act uh, that um, uh, for Ameren and ComEd to upgrade their facilities uh, to what's called the Smart Grid. And that might have an impact on renewables, both large-scale and uh, small-scale renewables. So with that, I will um, uh, finish uh, my re remarks, and we'll turn it over, back over to, to Jay for kind of moderating the question and answer time. All right. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I guess at that point, this point, uh, are there uh, seeing a few questions here uh, from, from the group. If there are others who have questions, please type them in. Uh, or let us know that you have questions so we can, can open your mic up. Uh, there were a couple of them. Jay, let's, let's go ahead and then field the questions. Uh, Kathy had asked uh, quite a few uh, excellent questions, and I'd like to circle back to her bio um, as well as if we had inadvertently skipped over that in the beginning. So, okay, that would you. be good. Um, kind of the first one, going back to your earlier slide there, um, Dave, you might clarify a little bit about uh, what it means to be in that green area within the state uh, as far as viability for a, a wind development, wind project. Yeah, um, so this just gives you a, um, um, a, a first pass at saying uh, is wind energy viable or not viable. So in all cases, you really have to do a measurement on site because it really does vary. So it's a generalization. But if you look at the, the green parts, um, especially in southern Illinois, they tend to be lower wind speeds that are not going to be um, uh, viable economically um, for large-scale wind development. That doesn't mean that you couldn't do, uh, you know, a, a turbine in your backyard and, and uh, do uh, fine, but in terms of very large wind projects, you tend not to see those in those uh, green areas. And um, uh, the National Renewable Energy Labs kind of classifies things as far as uh, different classes of wind. And in order to be economically viable, you really need to be in what's called class three or class four wind. And where most of the good wind sites in Illinois are right in between class three and class four. 
to get up to class five, you need to be like in North and South Dakota where it's really, really windy. Uh, but this is economically viable. But in, in Southern Illinois, you have more in the class two wind that's not gonna be generally economically viable. Right, and, and I would kind of help you with that or build on that in that uh, that doesn't mean that there's not some pockets or smaller developments, but as a, as a general rule, it's not real conducive to development. Um, Correct. Uh, well, sorry, I lost my place here. Uh, within your study on the land, on the uh, land use, did you look at anything on uh, uh, farmland values? Um, we did not. We only looked at uh, residential um, uh, development and didn't look at um, farmland. And in fact, if there was uh, a home that was not kind of didn't have a separation um, between you know, a, a separate deed or, or, or a property identification number for the, the home versus the farm, there was no way for us to separate out the value of the farm versus the value of the, of the residence. So we excluded that from our analysis. So it was just homes uh, that, that might have, you know, uh, considerable land surrounding them, but, but it was primarily uh, residential and not zoned agriculturally and not jointly owned. So we excluded that. And I will say I've gotten some questions and people asked about if we've looked at how long those um, um, the, the property stayed on the market, and that's an excellent question. It may have been that that um, homes um, stay on the market longer uh, in the presence of a wind farm uh, than not, but we couldn't get any reliable uh, data on that to do the analysis. So we just looked at uh, you know sales data. There were arms length transactions that we could get from county records. Okay. Once again, limited by some of your resources. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We access. just didn't didn't have the data. Um there's a question here from Ogle County about how did you check the model out to determine if it's Determine the. I'm not seeing all of it. Zach, can you help me out a little bit there? Sure. Uh, the question from Mobile County oh, is How did you check the model out for determining the cost of real estate? Yeah, so um, there's a couple things that, that we did in terms of um, uh, testing and training the model. So, one of the things that we did was uh, looking at, at um, model stability so you can uh, check. Whether um, you know whether it performs better during the early part of the period, later part of the period, and we tried to avoid those periods, obviously, that where it was, you know, the wind farms present and not present, because that's exactly what we wanted to uh, to tell. But there's a number of statistical techniques that you can go through to look to see if each uh, variable is explaining something in the overall. Um, uh, you know, property value uh, in all the ones in our final model obviously had had very good uh, statistical uh, significance that would say yes, they're explaining a lot of the variation uh, in price that um, that took place. And um, actually, in this case, we elected not to write, in a sense, a public report on that property value. This is um, Jennifer's actual capstone project. So you'll see it written more like a, you know, an economics journal article. So all the statistics, all the information uh, is out there um, uh, for people to to um, uh, to read and to see in terms of how the model was validated and, and how it's looked at. And Jennifer did such a nice job that it's been picked up by. Um, uh, I, I've heard it now uh, talked about by. Uh, ben Hohen of uh, the Lawrence Berkeley Labs, who's done a similar type um, uh, study, uh, and you know has, has really um, you know 
validated that it, it's a good model uh, for um, for what it looked at. Um, Kathy here had asked a question about uh, noise and strobe and noise and uh, strobe effects. Has there been any studies in Illinois? You want to address that one? Yeah, there. Um, most of what I've seen in terms of uh, county ordinances have have uh, looked at the Illinois uh, Pollution Control Board uh, standards for uh, for noise uh, effects. And to my knowledge, I haven't seen any um, noise studies that have been done uh, of the nature. We haven't done any uh, at um, at ISU. Uh, and the, the trick there, I think, is that each uh, a noise study needs to be done uh, on a very localized basis. Uh, and so usually you have, you know, acoustical engineers that come in and certify that, that this wind developer with, with this wind development will fall within the standards that are set by the county ordinance um, uh, that's there. Um, similar with strobing effects in terms of the shadow flicker that a, a wind turbine would be to minimize the effects on, on uh, homes that would be uh, in line for that shadow uh, flicker. There's this, uh, modeling that you can do up front um, and making sure with micro siting that you minimize the effects of that. Uh, so, but I haven't seen any general study. Usually each wind farm has as an expert that, that testifies to that particular um, wind farm's um, uh, you know strobing um, uh, effect, uh, shadow flicker, and the and the noise. Okay, shift gears a little bit. Uh, decommissioning question here: What's the most common form of decommissioning plans uh, used in the state? Is I guess I would ask the question: Is that something that Bill maybe is going to look at? I'll let Bill uh, chime in. I don't have a good answer to that as far as th there's a couple things that we've looked at decommissioning. There's what the county requires in terms of standards, how far below the surface uh, the land has to be restored, um, you know, electrical conduit and, and uh, other things of what exactly has to be restored. And then there's also differences across counties as far as what type of um, surety they have that the money is going to be there to decommission. Does that go into an escrow account, uh, a surety bond, or different um, type of uh, financial instruments to make sure the money's there when decommissioning actually comes uh, in, into being? And I'm not sure I have information on what, you know, which, which is most common across the state. Uh, uh, this is Bill, and maybe I can just add a little bit to that. Of course, we were much too young in this state in terms of wind energy development to have any experience, so we really don't know. But um, there have been decommissioning studies uh, performed uh, by uh, engineers, and uh, I have read a few of those. And uh, I think uh, the basic method of decommissioning, deconstructing a uh, wind turbine is to Kind of do what you did in reverse when you built it, and that bring in. Uh, you have to rebuild the access road, the gravel road, and the uh, crane pad. You do that. If they're already there, you just use them again. Bring in the crane. Uh, take the uh, blade, the cell, towers, loader down, and haul them away on the flatbed. Uh, and then with the foundation, they said normally. Four feet below the surface is a sort of standard depth to which the wind company is required to uh, remove the uh, foundation. And, and that actually can be done through dynamiting um, or through other methods of breaking up concrete and rebar. And then um, the uh, tower and other turbine parts can either be recommissioned by being rebuilt and used somewhere else or, or cut up and sold for scrap. All right. Thank you, Bill. Um, Dave, if you look, is there any discussion about, or, or there's a question here from Boone County, uh, 
to discuss the tension between the mandated uh, mandate of the 25 by 25 and the cost of activity because of the federal uh, tax credit lapse? Yeah, so uh, it's a it's a really good question. Um, presumably. Uh, if the production tax credit does not get renewed, that uh, will mean that the um, uh, the purchase of wind energy, renewable energy, will become more expensive because the wind developer uh, won't be receiving the production tax credit in the form of a subsidy, so they'll demand higher prices, and the, um, uh, that will uh, then... Um, you know, the, the Illinois Power Agency will see higher prices. Fortunately, as part of the renewable portfolio standard, it has a price uh, ceiling in there so that the RPS does not raise uh, rates um, too high. I think it's um, it may be 1% or 1.5% rise due in, in electricity rates due to the RPS, and so it can't go any higher. So even if those prices go higher, there's kind of a circuit breaker, if you will, in the RPS that says ratepayers aren't going to just, you know, get out the checkbook and sign for whatever it is. There's a maximum that ratepayers pay for renewable energy, and they just buy as much as they can uh, for for the maximum price. And we might not hit that 25% by 2025 if, in a sense, we can't afford it, if those circuit breakers come in in you might see that uh, in some years if the production tax credit doesn't get renewed. Okay. Um, there was a question here about uh, what what efficiencies have you used in determining the finances that you you've used here? You've indicated in your, your studies as far as. Well, efficiency as far as your what's been presented. Um, I'm not sure uh, I understand the question in terms of what uh, efficiencies I, I've. Uh, um, okay, we may, need some, we may need to get some clarification from uh, someone in Hillbrook County then. Um, quick question here, I think can be answered. Also, uh, have any turbines been erected in floodplains? Um, and. I don't know, um, one way or another. I don't, uh, I don't think so, but I don't know. Okay. Um, and one that I will answer. And there was a question here uh, about this. What you were talking about megawatts? That's the output capacity of the wind farm, not the number of towers. Uh, the towers, the turbines that are out there, most of them are in the. Uh, somewhere between 1.25 and 2.5 megawatts per tower, depending on which turbine is being used, which particular turbine is used in the farm. So I'll clarify that. With that, um, I would say that we move to a five-minute break. Uh, we'll pull this back together at uh, about 4.10, which I'll give you about six minutes, actually, um, if that's all right. So. Uh, we'll start the introduction so the next presentation is going in. If you've got additional questions, uh, go ahead and type those in. Uh, we'll try to follow with those to Dave or see if there's any particular ones that we need to cover. With that, thank you. Thank you, Dave, for your presentation. Thank you.
in the instance of being fair, I'll give you this. Let this be the kind of a one minute warning before we start back up. So we'll start, be starting back up in about a minute. Okay, I see that, that our next presenter is about ready to, to start. So I'm bringing the group back together in, in favor of getting everyone out of here on time as we planned on. Uh, I'd like to move forward. Next presentation is uh, by another member of uh, the Illinois Wind Working Group, another founding member of it, I should, should note. Uh, it's Bill Shea of uh, he formed his own law uh, firm here recently. I actually have to look it up and make sure I get the uh, Shea Law Group uh, Limited there in Peoria. Uh, had the opportunity to work with Bill uh, quite a bit over the last few years. Uh, volunteered his time to work with us in, in providing information to landowners and helping discuss this issue. Uh, he's got uh, quite of interest in renewable energy, and especially the legal aspects, uh, working with industry side, but working a lot with uh, the consumer side or the, or the, uh, the landowners and others as well. Uh, it's always a privilege to work and pleasure to work with him. Uh, and if you've heard his voice already, well, we'll turn this over to Bill if he's ready as soon as we uh, get our presentation up here. So, Bill? Very much, Jay. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I wanted to uh, make one comment about uh, Dave Loomis' presentation. Um, he referenced several uh, research reports and studies that uh, he and uh, some of the students have done, and I wanted to um, uh, give my plug for those and recommend those to anyone who has an interest in the subject at all. Well worth a read. And I especially want to uh, recommend the research report on the Illinois RPS. Uh, it goes far beyond the RPS and actually talks about um, the history of the relatively recent history of public utilities in the state and how power was purchased before deregulation and how it was after, and then now the you know, power agency in its role. And how the RPS or renewable portfolio standards very, very well researched. Um, in terms of uh, my role in this uh, business, um, I enjoy uh, being a member of and working with uh, others in the in working group, uh, starting with Dr. Loomis and his staff and CJ. And Bill? Uh, yes. Need to, we've got to ask you to speak up just a little bit. You apparently don't have a real good, as good a connection today. Some of them are a little, some are saying you're a little soft. Okay, is this better? Better. Okay, sorry. Um, I, um, um, I don't represent any wind companies, um, so I wanted uh, everyone on the call to, to know that. My perspective is from uh, representing landowners. Um, that's my area of concentration uh, in connection with wind energy projects. So I've got a lot of experience with uh, negotiating and documenting these leases and agreements. And when I do that, um, 
know, in a particular county for landowners, I always make it a point to make sure I understand the local uh, wind ordinance and permitting practices of, of a lot of you on the call and your uh, organizations. And then um, I also do my best to stay current with the industry in general and what wind companies are doing and, and how their projects, you know, what the little drivers for their projects are, because that helps in terms of uh, doing a good job for landowners. Um, I've also done a little bit of uh, consulting with a few of the state attorneys around the state who um, get charged with uh, responsibility for helping advise county boards on wind ordinances, and sometimes they um, can use um, a little extra help with that, so I've done a little bit of that as well. All right, um, I'm going to cover a few things that um, Dr. Loomis uh, covered, so I will probably gloss over some of these things that you've already been told about. Uh, just as far as background, um, it, it is helpful to understand um, when you're trying to regulate this as a local county regulator or otherwise some of the factors favoring wind power. Um, obviously, we've got um, the wind, which is um, in a sense free and uh, it's endless, it's just the problem is it's, it's intermittent and not constant. Uh, and wind power has the uh, advantage of not having uh, environmental emissions and, and very little to no water consumption, which differentiates these types of uh, generators from other traditional uh, generating plants. Um, turbine efficiency or the blade. Efficiency and, and the other parts um, of the turbine are increasing in, in efficiency, and so that's, that's helping uh, make wind power more um, viable. And then we've got the government incentives, of course, that everyone knows about, starting with the production tax credit. A uh, few photos. Um, again, I'll thank uh, Dr. Luminance and the staff for these. Um, Matt Alderman, I think, put these, and they're from a couple of projects in central Illinois. Here's the foundation after it's constructed, but before it's covered up. Um, this is a more common type of foundation, the, the so-called spread mushroom foundation, rather than the vertical one. And this is uh, what remains um, to be seen after uh, it's covered back up with their Here is a, a picture of a rotor built to the top of the tower and to which the blades attach. Uh, then the cell where the intelligence is, um, the generator and the gearing and a lot of the other mechanicals um, for a, a turbine. And then uh, this isn't a real good picture, but uh, this shows the pieces of the tower and the blade laying on the ground. <coughs> Uh, going too fast. Uh, tower interior. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been in one, but it's, it's worth doing uh, one time because it's uh, striking how uh, large these things are. Even <clears throat> inside, there's plenty of room to move around. And of course, um, people who maintain these things have to get up uh, into them, so they need a ladder. A couple of the pictures of towers. Uh, some of the wind companies in Illinois, this is by no means exhaustive, but um, some of the better known ones. Horizon uh, uh, was the developer of the um, project in Eastern McLean County, Twin Girls project that, um, that Dave mentioned. Um, so they are a premier one in the state and some of the others. Some of these are, um, uh, in Venergy, for example, is Illinois based. Um, others are in elsewhere in the U.S. and others are, are foreign companies but have U.S. operations, so they're, they're diversified geographically. Uh, what really makes wind energy uh, economical? How, how, how do they get financed and uh, how do projects bring a return for their owners? Uh, it's fairly simple conceptually, but the details are quite complicated. Uh, obviously, the revenue from capacity and Kilowatt hour sales, power sales, and renewable energy credits, or RBCs, sometimes called green cards, or the green uh, credits. 
Uh, those can be sold separately from the power. And then, of course, the incentive section of tax credit um, or alternatively uh, special investment credit or cash grant from the federal government and then accelerated depreciation. Those are the main drivers of the economics of the project. Uh, as far as the market structure, and I won't dwell on this because um, Dr. Lemon did, so I'll just go on. The renewable portfolio standards, again, um, as, as they said, um, this was uh, adopted in 2007, and the Illinois Power Agency administered this, and uh, certain minimum percentages of, of power that is, are purchased have to come from renewables. Most of that from, from wind. Um, and we should also note that um, because Illinois is a competitive market, um, you know, the utilities are playing a, a lesser role in actually the sales of electricity to end use customers. The more of that role is being uh, taken over by competitive retail uh, marketers, um, they're called in this state alternative retail electric. Or areas. And they have slightly different rules on um, the portfolio standards, but it's very similar to the utilities. Uh, right now, we've seen um, a decline in the market, not just in Illinois, but elsewhere. Uh, not as much new development. As they said, uh, the uh, in state preference for the renewable energy credit ended mid last year, so now uh, the Illinois utility. Procure their um, RPS requirements from out of state providers, not just Illinois. And it's been a general overall market price decline, a drastic decline in the, in the price of these renewable energy credits. The production tax credit, we would expire at the end of this year. Um, that's a huge factor in suppressing the market uh, with that uncertainty because without that, um, the economics really fall to the floor. And then uh, we're seeing um, movement towards additional transmission capacity coming in from the west, and that will allow um, more um, of the greater high efficiency wind energy in places like northwestern Iowa and western Minnesota, where there's a better wind resource than here. You get cheaper wind energy um, having access to the state here and to our customers. Projects are built, and that will, of course, drive down the market value of the Illinois wind project. As far as uh, getting down into the subject at hand here, um, again, I, I I am familiar with most of the um, local uh, government uh, county ordinances and practices uh, that apply to wind projects, um, but I do that in the context of representing. What I see is a, is a tension, and for the most part, a healthy tension, not unique to the wind energy industry by any means, but you know, the local government officials have their responsibility to regulate, to control, um, and then you've got the landowners that have their uh, interests and, and, and their right of, of contract to, to contract with these wind companies as they see fit. And so sometimes those overlap and and can be inconsistent, um, you know, decommissioning in terms of provisions is just one good example. We'll come back to that. Uh, county ordinance, uh, I'm not telling you anything new here. I'm sure all of you are aware of, of, of these factors. Um, the county ordinance and, and the permit to build one of these projects covers uh, many factors. These are some of the, the major ones. The, the roads. Uh, existing county roads that uh, need to be beefed up and uh, new roads that have to be built, uh, particularly for the wind project. Um, power size, uh, height, colors, um, other attributes of the urban, uh, minimum setback uh, distances on roads and uh, uh, buildings, residences, um, and so forth. Uh, standards for operating and maintenance uh, so that the um, project is kept up over its life. Environmental factors, uh, including those pertaining to wildlife and, and humans. Um, 
the shadow flicker effect and noise are just two that we, we talked about briefly. Uh, liability insurance required on the part of the wind company, and then um, decommissioning, which has been um, you know, a hot button um, issue for the last uh, couple of years at least, and has, um, has changed some in terms of how that is regulated by the local government. Um, in terms of uh, more what I do, uh, I'll cover a little bit about what these agreements with landowners um, involve. Uh, first of all, the parties, uh, usually it's pretty simple, it's the, it's the wind developer and it's the landowner. Um, and uh, the, the best way that uh, the landowner can have their interest representatives to gather um, in a group and hire uh, a single attorney or other advisor scale that way, and the attorney can do a better job um, for those landowners. Uh, the uh, wind developer is um, invariably a, um, usually a new entity, a single purpose LLC is a, is a typical um, wind uh, developer entity, and the only asset that that entity will own will be this wind project. Uh, that's important because that affects uh, many provisions of these agreements and, and affects how you all in, in enacting these ordinances, um, uh, how you uh, treat certain things because of that. Um, three main periods, time periods during uh, the life of one of these that involves the landowner lease and uh, easement. The development period is usually five to seven years. That's before, that's after the contractor signed with the landowners, but before any construction takes place, and that's because there's a lot of engineering and transmission planning and environmental permitting and all kinds of activities that take, take that amount of time. Then the construction period itself, which usually ranges between six and 18 months, and trending more towards the six months with more experience um, and better um, construction methods by the the operations period, and that's from the, from the uh, after the commercial operation date through the end of the life of the project, and that can be anywhere uh, from typically 30 to 50 years. Uh, focusing on a development period, what happens? Uh, again, a lot of um, siting activities, some of the other engineering and transmission studies that I mentioned. Um, there is a right uh, on the part of the company to terminate the project um, and terminate the uh, lease uh, agreement with the landowner. Um, they always insist on that right. And um, so in effect, what this does is it gives the wind company an option um, until they decide to go ahead and start construction. They really have an option and because they can get out of their obligations under the contract uh, during the development period. And usually during this time, there is not, not much intrusion on the landowner's land. During the construction period, this is when the maximum intrusion occurs, and this is when uh, the uh, landowner's land gets torn up. There's probably no better way to, um, to describe it. Um, it's, it's a construction site. And uh, so uh, the, the, the landowner should uh, assume that he will not be able to grow crops during that season that the construction occurs. Access roads are put in, um, underground cabling with uh, trenchers and other equipment. Uh, turbine crane pads are built. Uh, the uh, access roads put in, the turbines are, are brought in on flatbeds um, after the cranes are. And there's you know the crop damage, um, if there is any crop, uh, Compaction of soil, that's another big issue, and then uh, field uh, drain tile damage. Those are all things that have to be dealt with in this agreement. To get into the construction phase, I've just got a couple of construction photos here where we've got a turn lane that was put in to accommodate uh, heavy equipment, large equipment. Here's a picture 
of uh, the truck hauling a, a turbine uh, tower section. And then this is a pretty good overview shot of uh, an access road, special access road for light travel, uh, constructed with um, big uh, turn, uh, big turn uh, accommodating the uh, equipment here. And then this is the uh, turbine foundation, which has been poured. Here, the actual turbine is starting to be constructed on top of the foundation, the first section of the tower. I mean, these are huge cranes that are brought in to do this. All right, then we get into the operations period, and um, this is where the, the turbines have been built and everything else is in place. Um, basically, there you don't see um, a lot of activity normally because these things are, are, are not as far as human intervention uh, for the most part. So uh, you see some maintenance. Um, there are usually um, in these agreements, there's a right on the part of the wind company to what is called repower uh, the project. And, and that would mean um, if there is uh, some obsolescence, technical obsolescence of the, of the turbines and new technology, the wind company wants a right to be able to replace those turbines um, or any portion of those with newer equipment. Um, and they also would like the right to relocate those. Sometimes that's a source of negotiation. Uh, relocate them on, on the landowner's land to a different site. Um, restructuring of the project in terms of um, change in ownership, um, other types of restructuring, uh, those are always negotiated. And then what are the rights rights to the wind, the wind developer have and the landowner, uh, what rights, uh, what kind of defaults or breaches on the part of the wind company gives the landowner the right to terminate. And then we get into big decommissioning at the end of the um, operation period. And that's always a, a item of uh, much discussion and negotiation. Uh, compensation, uh, again, I won't go private Try to keep this short. Um, I don't want to too much detail, but uh, to me, this is not the most. This is the thing that most you know, landowners are interested in. But to me, it is not the most important uh, uh, issue in these uh, or item in these agreements. Um, but uh, nevertheless, it is important, and and, and these uh, projects can be a source of um, very good compensation for the landowners especially if they have one or more turbines on their property. But um, during the development period, that five to seven years, it's usually some sort of payment, um, often an amount per acre per year. Uh, and then during the operations period, um, that's when sort of the main portion of the revenue comes to the landowner. Um, a lot of that is uh, usually tied to the turbines, and it can be a fixed amount per megawatt per year, um, or it can be an amount that uh, is based on uh, the kilowatt hours produced by that turbine or by the entire project and it's averaged out over all the turbines, or it can be a uh, portion of the, of the dollar revenue that's achieved from that turbine. Um, oftentimes, there's also um, a payment per foot of access road or other um, method of, of paying for the access road um, being there. Uh, same thing with the underground cabling. Oftentimes there's a wind easement payment. Um, it could be how much per acre per year. Uh, it's really kind of a fuel charge, uh, in effect. A good neighbor payment. Uh, I think uh, Jay may have mentioned that earlier. That's usually paid if there's a residence on the property, and sometimes for the neighbor, and usually uh, there's an uh, inflation factor. Um, and then there are some special um, special items that are compensated for, but they, these are um, not, um, these are peculiar to only a few landowners. Um, you'll have overhead transmission lines coming out of the project substation to, to the interconnect with the utility, so that transmission line will only usually go across 
lot of very few landowner properties. And um, I often recommend that those be the subject of a separate agreement and, uh, because they've got special attributes that arguably should be uh, compensated for differently than the rest of the project. The project substation, um, that is um, a special item that should be compensated for separately. Oftentimes, the wind company likes to actually purchase the acreage on which they put their substation because they fully occupy it and the landowner has really can't do anything on that substation site. And then the project laydown yard during the period of construction, um, that, that can be 15 acres or so, sometimes more, and that's taken out of commission during the construction period and usually there's a special compensation for that. And then we take care of things like cost damage, compaction, recovery of legal fees of the, for the lawyers advising the landowners, so that's always something that we try to give them. And then the MFN is, is short for the most favored nation clause. And I'll just say that that, that is uh, intended um, ostensibly to protect the early landowners who sign up, but then later landowners in that same project area might get a better, might be able to negotiate a better deal. And so this most favored nation clause requires the wind company to come back and give that better deal to the initial uh, landowners are signed. Uh, what are the risks to the landowner? Um, uh, there are some, and uh, they can be significant. Uh, first of all, most of you probably heard of mechanic liens. Um, if a developer who uh, hires a lot of contractors, starting with engineers and, and other uh, workers who come in um, who might be employed by uh, an independent contractor who works uh, on the site for the project, they are not paid, then they can uh, they have a lien on the land. And of course, that would affect the landowner, so we have to have special provisions to take care of that in these leases. Uh, the real property taxes, uh, Dave talked about that and how that's done. Uh, uh, but again, um, these, these uh, turbines um, generate a huge amount of property taxes, and they are required um, to have their own tax ID number for the local county. Counties that have to do that. And issue a separate tax bill uh, to the wind company for that turbine. But if those aren't paid, um, then that can come back and, and hurt the landowner. If, you know, if to the, in the extreme case that uh, turbine was foreclosed upon, sold for taxes, uh, landowners can have a problem. Uh, decommissioning is always a big risk um, because at the end of uh, the project, as I said, these are always held by the wind company in a single purpose LLC and there are no other assets. And just because the wind company has a duty to um, deconstruct and remove the turbines and other equipment doesn't mean that they are going to do it. Um, and if they just uh, walk away from it and leave the landowner looking for somebody to sue, um, that can put them in, a, in jeopardy. So decommissioning um, security, financial security, and, that, and that's one of those things that uh, now almost universally covered in, a, in an ordinance, local uh, county ordinance, but uh, in my view also should be covered in, in the lease. And sometimes those can work across purposes um, if they're not careful. Um, and then um, the county ordinance, there's some risk to the landowner there because ordinances can change. So what um, the ordinance might say today um, Ten years from now, it might say something different. You've got to turn over in county board members and other factors, and uh, there's always issues with what extent you know, the county ordinance provisions that were in place when this was built. Uh, does, does the landowner enjoy um, sort of a kind of grandfathering type of uh, uh, notion to uh, enjoy the original provisions, or is the landowner subject to the, the changes that might occur over the life? Of the project, so that's a whole another issue. And then um, liability of the wind company for uh, damages and, and personal injury and so forth um, required to keep certain insurance and, and identify the landowner for certain things, which are all provisions in the contract. So, uh, in conclusion, um, and this is sort of my personal conclusion. I, I think wind energy has a place. Um, it's never going to be uh, the sole or even the dominant uh, provider.
provider of, of uh, electricity, mind you, in this country, but it can be an important component and a growing one. Uh, lots of things have to be coordinated to make that happen. Uh, and local government officials have their part in, in doing that. So uh, it's quite a challenge, I think, to balance the various interests involved with the public interest at the local level and enact the smart regulation. And I think to do that, the more that uh, local public officials can know about this, not just the company or this project, but about the, uh, the subject in general, including how, how this is regulated, uh, the better off they're going to be and the more intelligent decisions they'll make. So I'll stop there. We've got, uh, I think, a bit of time left for questions. Uh, I'll just turn it over to Jay. Okay. Um, do we have questions for for Bill and, and with respect to the legal aspects of things that he has covered to this point? I, I see that we've got some, and, and we're not going to discount the uh, questions that were asked earlier. Uh, of basically in the break there, essentially to Dave. Uh, but we want to give everybody a chance to ask questions of Bill as well. Um, I guess the question here is, Zach, am I missing any of them that you see? Or Kathy? No, I think we just have the ones that are in the box there. Okay. Well, seeing those, uh, Dave, are you still with us? Ah, we have a few coming in. I'm still here. Okay. Um, I guess we have one question for Bill. Uh, Bill, in your experience, are most decommissionings required, decommissioning to require upfront monies put in by the wind turbine companies? Um, well, um, I guess we to answer that, uh, you can look at it from the perspective of the landowner and what the landowner might try to negotiate and, and then look at it from the county and what they might try to impose in order. Um, I think it, um, the way the commissioning financial security started off was, in my experience, uh, it wouldn't kick in until, say, year 12, year 15, after uh, commercial operations started, because it was viewed that uh, the risk uh, was very low that there would be a failure of the project you know, during that, for that many years at least. And that's probably true, uh, because once once the project is built, you know, there's, a, there's a huge sunk cost for these things. Um, a typical commercial size wind farm, there can be four or five hundred million dollars spent before there's one change of revenue. And once you've got that built, that's a sunk cost. And if the say the market value of wind of power in general dropped through the floor or other things happened that made that threatened, you know, wind energy, well, these projects can operate pretty cheaply after they're built because the ongoing cost got taxes and landowner payments and a little bit of operation maintenance, but it's fairly inexpensive to operate them once they're built. So, you know, of course, it came to worse. Um, the uh, an owner could step in and take take over a new owner if necessary and, and operate these things with, at a very low cost and probably a low price and make it viable. So, um, I think that's why um, it is as important to have. Um, security in place uh, early now, but um, on the other hand, um, you got to look at the type of security, and obviously a, a cash escrow is the most secure, and um, the reason I say that, uh, you look at bonds um, or letters of credit, um, a typical um, a performance bond, security bond, you know, they don't have a long life, and sometimes those are just written by um, Insurers and other other parties who write those kinds of instruments, um, maybe for a year at a time, and then they have to be renewed every year. 
Well, if you get out into uh, towards the end of one of these projects, um, let's just say the wind company just fails to renew it, and then there's the bond is gone. And what do you have? Uh, then, of course, you can sue the wind company to make them replace that bond or renew it, but you know, if they walk away, uh, you might be left holding the bag. So, I think it takes a lot of really um, intense uh, understanding of how the different forms of financial security work and uh, and the risks of um, the failure of these projects over time, and uh, put in place you know, the right kinds of security. And then the other factor is uh, for the wild card is what's the scrap value of these projects? You see some studies where they support to claim that the scrap value of a turbine and the other equipment can actually exceed the cost of the construction. Um, well, you know, that might depend on the per pound market value of scrap steel and copper at that time in that year. It may or may not be true. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. Well, and there's a there's kind of a related question here of in terms of decommissioning, how very how Buried throughout the state, are the landowners held liable for the, in the case of developer, in the case of developer, the uh, uh, default? Well, um, yeah, it's on the the, the the turbines on the landowner's land, and uh, if if the wind company uh, does not uh, honor the commitment to deconstruct, uh, remove the turbine and the other equipment. Of the lease, you know, we don't have a fund in this state to tap into for that. At least yet, we can talk about creating one. Um, so I guess you look back at the landowner, uh, the landowner responsibility. Okay. We also got a question here about the uh, the most favored nation clause and what does it mean? How does it? A little bit more about how it works. Just define it a little better for sure. Okay, um, let me uh, just give you an example. Um, let's say that uh, Jay uh, is a landowner and uh, Acme Wind Company approaches him and uh, puts a, a, a lease in front of him. So they're, they're moving into the area, they plan on developing a wind project, and he's number one and he's like in the sign, and he does, and he's got his terms and conditions, and he's happy. And then a few months later, you know, he's in the coffee shop and he hears about some of his neighbors uh, who have signed more recently. And they seem to get more money and better terms than Jay, and now he's upset. Well, um, if Jay signed it and he doesn't have one of those clauses, he's kind of stuck. But if he does have a most favored nation clause, um, and I won't go into exactly what those say, but um, the, the essence of it is that um, if someone else in the project, in this project, gets better terms than Jay, uh, Jay's lease will be rewritten to match those terms. Um, now, um, that, that can provide some comfort to people like Jay. But on the other hand, uh, it can be um, used to the wind company's advantage um, in the following way. If they've got a lot of these uh, Jay Fountains they've signed up on good terms early, and then they've got somebody holding out who they really need and wants more uh, money and so forth, uh, uh, more option or harder negotiator landlord. Well, the wind company's position with that landowner would be, well, we'd love to give you a little more money, and we could afford to do so, except for this little clause we've got. He'd have to go back and give everybody else the same money that you want, and we just can't afford to do that. So that's how such a clause can be used to the wind company's advantage um, in those kinds of circumstances. Okay, thanks, Phil. Let's go back and to pick up some of the other questions that were out there. Um, one of the individual asked, uh, basically have done some research and that at this point only 1% of the energy is, can be accredited to uh, wind energy being produced. Uh, what, where do we stand at here in Illinois on the percentage? Do you know that one, Dave? Um, we're, um, we're close to about 5%. Uh, in Illinois, um, but if you look nationally, so when you looked at that um, uh, national map, you're um, you're at a lower percentage because 
uh, of the southeast. Uh, you're not doing anything in terms uh, of wind energy. Um, solar is a smaller portion um, than wind. And so nationally, uh, you're uh, you're looking at between one and two percent. So we're we're well ahead in Illinois. So it depends on the scope of what you're looking at. Um, there was a report done um, by the U.S. Department of Energy to look at, at technical feasibility, and they found uh, that we could do uh, 20 percent of our electrical needs by uh, wind energy. Um, and that would be technically feasible. We had the wind resource and so forth. It doesn't necessarily say that it's economically viable to do that much, uh, but it, it'd be, um, we'd have the wind resource and we'd have the uh, uh, availability to, to uh, do that. Okay. Also have a question here about your studies. So do you, you, you've had students do the studies already, the impact of on values, isn't it true that other studies have found that uh, found a loss in property value, such as Clarkson University study? That's correct. There's a there was a study that was done by uh, Clarkson University uh, um, where they found uh, that there was a statistically significant uh, impact. Um, that was, I believe, in uh, New York State. Um, they looked at a wind farm and found um, a decline in property values um, using a very similar methodology to, to what we um, did. And so I guess, uh, you know, you, you say, well, well, why does one study say one thing and, and one another? And I really look at it as far as um, you, you really have to look at, at um, uh, regional differences, you know, so, so people's uh, preferences and values as far as what they're willing to pay for a property um, uh, may be different, say, in Illinois than, uh, than New York State um, with things, but that study um, uh, does very similar methodology to, to the two studies that I presented here for Illinois. Okay. Um, got a, another question. Ask how many when when projects have been shut down in Illinois, and is there any decommissioning going on in the state at this time? I, I don't um, know as we've had uh, any wind farms, uh, to my knowledge, that have been uh, shut down. So all the 17 that I presented in terms of the economic impact uh, are uh, up and running. Uh, and because that decommissioning, as Bill said, is going to take place uh, at the end of the useful life or uh, might uh, very well be repowered with newer technology, we haven't had any experience in terms of decommissioning uh, here in Illinois. Okay. Um, let's see here. This may be back to Bill. Is it better for the developer and the possible future owner to have a escrow account or a surety bond or both in the decommissioning plan? Um, well, I think a bond uh, can be fine if uh, the landowner can assure that the bond is going to remain in place until the time take the service down uh, and remove the other equipment. Um, and as I said earlier, the, the problem with bonds often is that they, they have a short life and they have to be renewed. And uh, things are going along fine. The wind company will, be, will get it renewed every year and, and the, whoever writes that bond will, will do it uh, in exchange for the premium. The problem is if we get out towards uh, somewhere out there where the wind considering uh, ending the project for one reason or another, and they don't renew the bond, um, then what happens? Uh, so for that reason, uh, a cash escrow is preferable um, as long as, again, that is um, off, um, off of, out of the control of the wind company, off their books, can be reached by the wind company creditors, only be reached uh, by the landowner or landowner's agent for one purpose. So uh, 
that would be my bias. Other than I, uh, I posted a link out there. We've got some resources out there. Um, Kathy, do you want to speak to the what was included in some of the packets and their information that they were able to get a hold of, uh, including the uh, Western Illinois, Illinois Institute of Rural Affairs uh, wind resource? Certainly, Jay. Um, there, I think this is a, a very strong collaborative working throughout the state on, on the behalf of, of individuals and local governments. And one of those entities that's been a really active partner in the Illinois Wind Energy Working Group is the Illinois Institute for Rural Affairs. And we, um, if you didn't get in your packet, you might ask at the county office for a copy of a, just a one-page fact sheet. And it, it's going to give you the results of a recent survey that was completed in 2011 that looks at um, what's the status of zoning around the state. And so you can see a, a really clean map that illustrates which counties have zoning that includes wind, uh, counties that have a wind ordinance only, and uh, counties with zoning only, and then no zoning. Um, the other important part of this resource is that if you go to the Illinois Institute for Rural Affairs website, you can actually um, retrieve the language for these various ordinances by county, and there's uh, direct contact information that they're using as part of their survey process. So this is a really nice uh, summary for local governments to tap into. If you didn't get that printed, uh, we will be posting it on our website and providing some links back to it. Dave, do you also have this posted on, on the um, Illinois State University's website as well? Um, which was that that you were asking whether I have posted? Um, the Institute survey, the wind um, zoning. Yeah, we yeah we have a link out um, to Jolene Willis's. Uh, survey at IIRA. Yep. Okay. Very good. Dave, do you want to speak to a little bit about the the wind length that you've got? Sure. The um, uh, in addition to our own reports and so forth, we have a set of uh, of links there, the resources that you'd find on on wind energy that goes out to other sites that we found uh, to be. Uh, helpful to people. So if you uh, go to that uh, link, you'll um, uh, find uh, other links uh, out there to additional information to what we have uh, available and kind of complements what we have available on our website. Thank you, Dave. I uh, would like to acknowledge that that's an accumulation of a lot of uh, us involved in wind energies. Uh, links and trying to keep that up and running. I uh, really appreciate them hosting that. Neat thing is that it does, it's not just the links, but it gives you some reference to what is that those links and you kind of sort through what you need to find. Did have one real quick questionnaire for our, for our Bill. Uh, who should control the escrow account, uh, the county or the landowner? Um, well, good question. Um, th there are reasons for each or either, um, or each of them. It. Uh, the county, the reason for the county control is because it's just a single uh, party and uh, you know, it can be administered more easily that way than if you have uh, quite a few different landowners. Just, uh, uh, I think what the wind company, uh, what I've seen them prefer to do when they've got, uh, say, uh, a bonding or other financial security requirement uh, with land a landowner, they like to um, have that be able to combine all the landowners with that composition and have a single security that uh, benefits them all. So, um, I, I would say, you know, again, uh, my preference overall is for the landowner to have those provisions in place, but then you've got what's called privity of contract, and the landowner can 
exercise those rights and uh, draw on that escrow directly and not have to go through the county and rely on the, on the county officials to do it and to do it the way you know, the landowner thinks it should be done. Um, so uh, I'm not sure I answered the question. I, generally, I just I, I, I prefer I prefer personally to have financial security uh, in in the contract in the private contract. But uh, obviously, having it with um, the, the county uh, through the ordinance is the next step. Okay, thank you, Bill. At this point, I'd like to thank both of the presenters for their uh, presentations. Also, thank like to thank all of you for attending uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, Tele Institute, uh, and just glad to be able to be part of it. And turn it back over to uh, Kathy. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I would just echo your comments. I think today's program was a, an excellent, uh, very informative presentation uh, by both of our, our presenters. And I really appreciate the support and collaboration of each of the entities. As we conclude this year in our programming, if you have thoughts on how we uh, best approach local government education for the coming year. Please be sure to share those with your county extension office, and we look forward to working with you again on next year. Thanks very much. Just as one more quick reminder, um, the recording of today's program is available at the link um, that you can find in the chat box. So if you know anyone else who may find this of value, please share it with them. Thank you.